Welcome to Legal Views with your host, Attorney Sheila R. Stewart. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in with us on today. We are so excited to be here. We have with us Judge Cassandra Lewis all the way from Chicago, Illinois. I first want to give a happy shout out to Daryl Breath all the way in Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you for hosting us and also to Minister Donnie Savage. We are broadcasting live on CJOY Network, Live 365, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you so much for being with us on today. We are going to unravel some very interesting topics on today, and we have an expert with us. Judge Lewis is an <laughs> expert on many different topics, and so we're going to just have a fun discussion, you know, talking about some serious issues. But these are issues and concerns that many people need to be aware of today. There is a lot going on in the United States, and so what we want to do is just help you to stay abreast of all of the different things that's taking place uh, in the United States. We have the whole issue with voter registration, the Aubrey case. We also have the new Philadelphia law that, uh, that had, this is the first law that has created equality for individuals to prevent them from being stopped with low grade or low level traffic violations. So we're gonna, and we have time, we're gonna try to go through as many of these um, topics and subject matters as we can. How are you doing, Judge Lewis, before I read your, your information? How are you doing today? I am wonderfully, wonderfully blessed. Thank you so much for asking. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, judge, you are a circuit judge from Chicago, Illinois. How long have you been sitting on the bench? Um, 19 years. Oh, wow, it's been 19 years? <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it either. How many trials have you presided over? I I couldn't even imagine. At least 100, would you say at least 100? <laughs> Uh, at least thousands, I would think. I, okay, I'm good. I'm, I'm trying. I, I, and see, if I if I go low and be conservative, then you will go high. Okay. So yes, you, were, you have presided over thousands of trials over the last almost twenty years. Yep, and over uh, and I don't know how many hundreds of jury trials. Wow. Yes. And so, what what has been the main uh, type of case that you have seen? Do you have you seen more criminal? Or is it just a variety of, of civil matters? Um, well, in Cook County, you know, because it's so large. It's extremely um, large. Yes. So we have um, a very um, compartmentalized court system. So right now I'm assigned to what is referred to as the um, law division. And law division cases are cases that are um, very serious civil cases, um, oftentimes involving catastrophic injury. So medical malpractice cases, train accident cases, um, 1983 cases um, dealing with police or allegations of police brutality. So those are the kind of cases that I hear um, almost exclusively. I haven't heard a criminal case since probably uh, 2003. Oh, really? Yes, because I've been basically, uh, I'll use the term on a civil track. So there was a time when I heard the smaller uh, jury trials, uh, like car accidents, um, fender benders, and maybe something a little bit more serious. And then uh, I moved up to cases where there would still be car accident cases or bus accident cases, but there was um, some personal injury, maybe some, maybe a, a little, not serious personal injury, but maybe not quite minor either. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 17 and 14, I'm sorry, seven years ago, I was assigned to the law division and that's where the most serious um, personal injury cases are heard uh, in Cook County. Okay, that's very, that's very interesting. And so sitting as a sitting judge, 
and you see so many different complicated issues that come into your courtroom, like you talked about previously, Section 1983 cases where uh, police officers acting under the co color of law have uh, allegedly violated the civil, the constitutional rights of an individual. Chicago being a very, very big city, I heard an English teacher say that you're not supposed to use <laughs> the word very, and I just did it three times. <laughs> <laughs> so Chicago being a very large city, okay, how do you think um, juries, what do you, talk to us about the jury selection process uh, in Chicago, because I want to, I want to just talk about the Aubrey trial for a few minutes before we get into the, uh, the, the, the new law in Philadelphia. What is the process in uh, Chicago for Cook County for selecting a jury in terms of what the uh, the attorneys do to make their selection. Um, okay, so do you mean like what criteria do they? Um, yes, consider? like the von Deer process and their preemptory mm -hmm. challenges. How how can that be used to manipulate the uh, makeup of a jury? So um, I'm sure most of your viewers know that. Um, you have a group of people come in and they um, have been summoned to jury duty. And then, so in my county, um, I will call down and say, okay, I need 36, 42, whatever the case might be. So they'll send up the 42, we'll say. And I, in my courtroom, and every judge is a little bit different. Some judges are dramatically different. But um, in my courtroom, I do allow the judge, the lawyers to um, conduct the questioning. Some judges require the lawyers to submit their questions to him or her, and then she does conducts the entire voir dire. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's fair. I think that um, the lawyers should have a right to have interaction with the juror so that they can, you know, assess that person's demeanor as it relates to them. Uh, see what type of eye contact that person maintains with them. And it may be that there's a something that, an answer that the lawyer elicits that may require a follow-up. And, you know, if I'm the judge and I've already had the questions given to me, I don't, there's no space really for a follow-up. So um, I, I think it, I think that I know the lawyers prefer it. And, uh, and I th just think it's a better process to allow the lawyers to ask the questions themselves. But I do, you know, set parameters and I take into account um, how complex I think the case is. For example, how many parties, if there's one defendant, if there's five defendants, um, how many claims there are, um, how many plaintiffs there are. Um, and again, just the actual um, issues that we're dealing with and all those things help me to determine how much uh, time and how much leeway I'll give the attorneys. But that being said, um, Again, uh, my philosophy is to allow the lawyers to ask um, more detailed questions maybe than some other people may. And mm -hmm. in fact, for a long time, there were a lot of rules that limited areas that could be gone into or restricted them to some extent. Um, but recently, case law has indicated that um, the, the judicial system, the legal system is now understanding that getting a little bit more into the woods, into the weeds of some of these issues is really um, is really a better process if you're trying to find people who are unbiased. And the last thing I wanted to mention about that, again, one of the reasons I think it's important to allow the attorneys to do, conduct their own voir dire is because I have learned from years of experience, almost invariably, the potential jurors will be more candid with the lawyers than they are with me. I think a lot of times for whatever reasons, uh, people are a little bit, um, I don't wanna say afraid, but I'll just say reluctant to say mm -hmm. anything contrary to what the ju what they may think the judge wants to hear. So typically when I, I ask questions that may deal with some uh, issues of bias and they'll give me you know, the credited answer, but then when the lawyers question them on the same topic and they maybe um, tweak the question just a little bit, then they'll say something different because, you know, they're not um, as disinclined to be, uh, to be, I'll say, 
contrary to what the uh, the attorney is uh, proposing, if you follow what I'm saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I do. I, I think uh, the reason why I was asking your opinion on how this is handled, because as you know, we had a, a young African-American male, uh, um, Amon Aubrey, that was jogging in Georgia, and he was on his regular run, and he was seen by three men. These three men uh, allegedly jumped in the truck with weapons armed, heavily armed, and chased him down with a Confederate flag on the side of the truck. And Mr. Uh, Aubrey, in this, you know, in this pursuit, he was killed. And many use the word murdered in cold blood. This trial is now taking place. Howbeit, the jury has been selected and the jury that has been impaneled is an all uh, white jury. I think there's one. I think they have one African-American. Yeah, one African-American. And how, and the judge even made a comment about this jury that the, uh, that the uh, defendant's attorneys use manipulated in so many words, manipulated the process and use their preemptory challenges to remove all of the uh, other uh, African-American jurors from this, uh, from the jury. So now this case is being heard, is being heard with this, with this jury. What do you think in terms of, and this jury, which is very important, it does not represent the population of Georgia. It does not rec re uh, represent mm -hmm. that demographic area. What are your thoughts as it relates to juries being impaneled for serious crimes such as this and is not representative of the demographics? Uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, um, just for the benefit of, I guess, you know, like the three people who don't know what a peremptory challenge is, uh, let me define that. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. So. When the attorneys go through um, voir dire, which voir dire is the process of questioning the potential jurors. So when the Lord, the court and the lawyers go through voir dire questioning these people, uh, the lawyers have a certain number of challenges, which are referred to as peremptory challenges, which in other words means challenges that they can use to um, excuse a potential juror for virtually no reason. So mm -hmm. if, if, if a lawyer, this is just to give you a, um, to dra dramatize how um, insignificant the reason could be. So if the lawyer doesn't like people to wear green, he could excuse someone just because they have on green and they don't have to voice why they're excusing someone. So if they feel like the person just looked at them wrong or uh, they don't like where the person works, they don't like how long the person has lived in the community, whatever it is, um, a peremptory challenge allows you to excuse that person for a reason that you may not be able to articulate or may choose not to articulate. Uh, and without, um, without, I say, penalty. So you can get rid of that person. Now, there is a caveat. You cannot do it for impermissible reasons. For example, you cannot excuse someone because they're Black. You cannot excuse someone because they're Hispanic, Asian. You cannot excuse someone because they're white. So, um, but the law is you want the person, the jury to represent not so much the demographic, even though, as you pointed out in Georgia, uh, you would think there would not be a, a great deal of difficulty finding African-American potential jurors. But um, the jury is supposed to be a jury of the defendant's peers. So a lot of people interpret that to mean persons who have their same background, um, not 100%, but have sh some shared experience. Now, um, there's a law referred to as the Batson Law, which prevents you from excusing someone due to race. So what I have learned, unfortunately, in my experience on the bench is that so few people are prepared to raise what is referred to as a Batson challenge. Okay. I don't know what it is. 
And um, as a person of color, you know, I'm sensitive to that. I mean, if I'm sitting there and I see the same lawyer excuse every black person, then I mean, a red flag is going to run. I'm going to something's going to raise a red flag in my mind. And what I found out when talking to my other colleagues, my um, Caucasian colleagues, they have observed the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, it's just based on race. But I mean, factually, if you sit there and you see there are five African-American potential jurors and the same lawyer excuses all five, then I mean, you have to say, okay, wait a minute, what's going on here? So what I have done, which is not fantastic, but I feel like I have to, I kind of, um, when I have the lawyers in private, I just kind of make a little bit of an inquiry. And in fact, I had a Caucasian um, colleague who would actually require you to complete a form when you use the peremptory challenge. Now, I don't know that that would have stood up, you know, <laughs> in the appellate court or Supreme Court, but in his courtroom, that's what they had to do. And they had to establish that it was not for an impermissible reason. But I can tell you um, that that is something that's very difficult because for whatever reason, a lot of times the jury pool is not reflective of the community as you've indicated. So you, for example, in Illinois, in Cook County, Chicago, I mean, I'm sure we have like 40% African-Americans, but I can assure you, I have never seen a jury pool with 40% African-Americans. So um, a lot of people have discussed, okay, so where are we getting these persons that we are um, summonsing? Where Where's the list coming from? So if you look at a list, like a lot of people have proposed to use the driver's license list because everybody has a driver's license, you know, virtually everybody. Mm -hmm. And that is more egalitarian. But if you... Um, pick something that maybe uh, is skewed to a certain um, economic strata or uh, professional strata, then you're going to, in essence, frankly, um, disproportionately impact your, your jury pool and to the what, disadvantage of, of some minorities. Yeah, that's excellent. Excellent information. Now, one of the things, key, key pieces of information that I left out when I was just given a quick snippet of the over overview of the Aubrey issue, Aubrey case, is that the three gentlemen, the three men that jumped into, into the car, into the truck, heavily armed, these were white men. And they were, they're allegedly uneducated white men. So that the jury that's making up this trial, this for mm -hmm. the deceased, mm -hmm. they are primarily uneducated uh, white people. And so the defense is saying these this jury is representative of the defendants in this case. And I think that's a little extreme. Uh, and so how do you fix this? And so are you saying that the way that you fix this issue is through the Batson? Um, absolutely. That's one of the ways. But another one of the ways, as I said, is examine the procedure for summoning the people to jury duty in the first place. I mean, if mm -hmm. you only if if you if you don't look at it and really try to say, how can I get a cross um, section of the society that we live in, the community that we live in? Um, I don't think that you're going to be, I don't think that it's going to happen just through happenstance. I think it's going to have to be a concerted effort to sit down and figure out why are we not getting this right? What do we have to do to make sure that we tap, you know, virtually every eligible person for jury duty, which is not happening? Well, that's a very difficult, uh, you know, charge because most people try to get out of jury duty you know that right they think a very excuse uh in the book to get out of jury duty and then when they see situations such as this they say it's a miscarriage of justice so it is very important that we uh that we make ourselves available for jury duty for these types of cases but what that's a different that's a different question though okay so it's one thing um, about how you deal with somebody who has been summoned and then for whatever reason attempts to avoid serving. Mm -hmm. But I am talking about the fundamental question of who are we even getting to come into the courthouse? Who's actually getting the summonses? 
So mm -hmm. that that's the fundamental problem, I think. That that is a foundational problem. Okay. Who shows up today for the big trial? No, no, not who shows up. Who mm. gets the invite to, to show up? Exactly. The mailing mm. list of the people who are summoned. Mm -hmm. So if you if you somehow um I don't know, if you use a demographic that I'm going to use this example. Um, you may remember years and years ago, uh, there was an example they used in politics about when, uh, I think it was when Eisenhower ran for president, and I think his opponent was Dewey, whoever, whoever won against Dewey. So what happened was the people who were doing a poll, they telephoned all these people to try and determine who was going to, to, to um, question them to see uh, to see if they could predict who would win. So they predicted that Dewey would win. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, <laughs> he didn't win. There's no President Dewey. So what they later discovered was that their whole process was skewed because they telephoned people. And guess what? Everybody didn't have a telephone back then. And guess what? Only the more um, well-heeled people had telephones so mm -hmm. they limited their demographic to the point that their poll became completely useless so that's what i'm saying if you if you if your um formula for reaching out to these people is flawed then everything that stems from that is going to be flawed in a case like aubrey's I, i'm just asking an opinion in a case like aubrey what do you think are going to be is going to be the likely outcome well, I mean, obviously, I don't know. I left my crystal ball at the office, but um, I'm, I'm optimistic. I mean, I think that the facts uh, speak for themselves. Um, and I think that we are in a new climate because of the whole thing with um, Floyd. So I think that there's a heightened sensitivity to, to the issues that black people face. So if this were five years ago, um, I probably would not be quite as optimistic, but I think that it's pretty clear um, from what we've heard so far, obviously we haven't sat in the courtroom and heard the evidence and the evidence haven't, hasn't even been completed. I don't even know how much of it has begun, but um, based upon what we've been led to believe actually happened, I think that the jury is going to do the right thing. Interesting. Well, I don't know. I have to see more of the evidence, hear more about the evidence and, and listen. I know that the attorneys that's actually representing Aubrey, they, they seem, I'm not Aubrey, representing the three men that are accused of the murder and they're, and they're uh, sent, they're facing life in prison, imprisonment without parole. Those gentlemen don't seem to be doing a very good job. They did a good job with the jury, but the presentation, you know, and the opening mm -hmm. statements haven't been that impressive. That, so what do you think this says about the judicial system when years later, the criminal system, the judicial system, and you're a judge, when a person can run, go for a run, and they end up uh, murdered. What do you think this is saying? Do you, th do you think America is trying to move in the right direction? We're moving in the right direction, or we still have a lot of work to go? I know that's a loaded question, but I just wanted to get your, your thoughts on that. Um, I guess, first of all, I don't really think that um, this incident necessarily speaks to the condition of the justice system. I think it is a broader societal question. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I really, I think that I can say what people have said, you know, for decades, for scores of years, and that is in some areas we are progressing and in other areas it seems like we are regressing. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we live in an environment where those three gentlemen felt justified, if I can use that term, in, in, in engaging in this activity that they, you know, claim was an effort to do some community or civilian policing, 
I think that I think that speaks uh, volumes, and I think that talks about. I think that uh, illustrates how far we need to go, how how um, far we haven't come from the days of uh, Trayvon Martin. I mean, it's almost the same, you know, situation um, to me. So it shows that we haven't progressed as much as we thought. On the other hand, um, I think that we've seen other aspects. We've seen so many more um, police prosecutions when people have allegedly, um, police officers have been accused of uh, using uh, excessive force or uh, unjustifiable force people police officers are being prosecuted and they're being convicted and they're being sentenced to prison we had a case here <clears throat> the laquan mcdonald case yes. which made um national um headlines and the police officer was charged he was tried convicted and sentenced so that is huge because that just didn't happen just a few years prior. On the other hand, um, the judge reduced his sentence to something that was really minimal, uh, which I don't understand. And again, I haven't reviewed all the pleadings. I didn't sit in the courtroom. I didn't hear the arguments of counsel. But um, it seemed to me that he really reduced the sentence to something that was really, really um, meager. But I mean, I think that's where we are today. I think we have I can't even explain it. I mean, it's hard for me to reconcile, but I see areas where we are really progressing, where um, I'm proud of being part of this democracy. And then there are other areas where I'm horrified at how much uh, things seem like they're still, you know, in the Jim Crow era. Okay, very, very good. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Jim Crow era because I want to get your opinion on some of the, the new voter registration movements that have been taking place across the United States in response to uh, the voter suppression that has that many people have been experiencing. For those that are not familiar with the case that you just spoke in terms of, can you just give a quick overview, a snippet of that case? The Laquan McDonald case? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, sadly, it is an all too familiar story. It's a young black man unarmed um, and the police come on the scene and yada, 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 the black person ends up dead. So um, what, what was interesting about the case and what was pivotal about the case is that um, all we had was the citizens, the observing citizens' uh, observations or reports of what happened, and then we had the police officer's version. So um, there was really no traction. But then one of my colleagues who I admire greatly uh, had the case come before him and it, it was determined that there was actually um, body cam footage. Mm -hmm. And he ordered that the footage be released. And once that footage was released, it was just like George Floyd. I mean, people saw what actually happened. Um, so I don't know. I, I hope that I answered your question um, sufficiently, but it was a situation with a young black man and he was running from the police and uh, he was shot. And, and the officer, his name was Van Dyke, I think the former officer, now convicted uh, person, uh, I think he shot him like 17 times. I mean, and you can see that the child, the young person is on the ground and he's just, you know, shooting away and he wasn't even the uh that wasn't even his like beat you know he he just kind of was somewhere else and came to the scene and then he just i don't know i just i don't know i can't imagine what he was thinking but anyway that's what happened and so that story is really really um pivotal because that is the story that broke that ultimately resulted in the then sitting um, state's attorney for Cook County being unseated. And it's also the case, well, let me say many people are of the opinion that um, that was the case or that was a significant portion of the reason that our then mayor, Rahm Emanuel, um, chose not to seek reelection because I'm sure he must have 
um, ascertain that his chances were not conducive to a successful run. Now that case, you know, it's, it's so sad. That was a very young person. Um, yes. That was shot so many times. I think times. he was 17. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, he was, he was under 19. I would say, I thought he was 16, but he could have been 17. Maybe he was 16 at the time of the shooting, but he was very young. And yes. it's, it's my uh, sense of outrage is there's no benefit of the doubt given to these young people and that the uh, the interaction between law enforcement and the and these young people is the decision to kill and not yes. to uh, you know to speak to this person to uh, you know handcuff the person or even just tase the person but the yes. decision is so you know horrendous and it and it takes the life and once that life is taken you can't obviously you cannot get it back and that is one of the biggest problems that we're seeing with our young people and our young men that are uh, that have these encounters with the police it often ends up in a deadly encounter yes yes and, and when you, you're seeing this across the United States, big cities and cities that have more people of color. Now, this brings us to a, uh, another discussion I would like to have with you. Uh, this deals with the city. Uh, this deals with Philadelphia. And as you know, the mayor, they have they, these are the, the mayor. He's the first one to sign off on this new law. It's a driving equality law. And it makes it illegal for officers, for law enforcement to stop individuals with low level traffic uh, violations. So you, so because what, what the uh, backstory is that oftentimes people of color, black and brown people of color, when they are stopped for these low grade traffic violations, a tail light is out and, uh, you know, it ends deadly like we we're speaking of with this young man that someone ends up deceased. And, right. it, and it was just over uh, initially a broken taillight or the blinker wasn't working. And somehow this stop turns into a death. Your thoughts on this new equality driving law? Um, well, I absolutely support it. And I had an opportunity to hear um, Isaiah Washington. I guess he was an assemblyman who um, if he didn't draft the law, he um, was one of the co-sponsors. And he was um, discussing the fact that, uh, as you pointed out, so many of these low-level traffic stops escalate to the point where people's lives are in peril and sometimes lost. Um, what I One thing I thought was very um, a wise move on their part is that they did it in, co in collaboration with the police department. Mm -hmm. So they didn't just, you know, in a vacuum say, okay, we're going to pass this law. But they sat down and they had a conversation about how best can we approach this. And according to him, the police were very much on board um, with this uh, legislation. I think it's really important and there have been so many studies to show that black and brown communities are what they call over-policed. And the experts have indicated like social scientists that if an area is over policed then it's just right for additional or um more conflict among citizens and officers so they um the study discusses the difference between certain black and brown communities and certain majority communities and they talk about a lot of times the criminal activity is greater in the majority communities, but they go undetected because they're not, they don't have this community uh, policing that, um, I shouldn't say community policing, but they don't have this um, over policing where, you know, the policemen are on every corner. Uh, they're constantly, you know, like stopping people if they see like, you know, the big thing is like young people gathering on the street corner, all that. Um, and it just, leads to more contacts and then you have a greater percentage of those contacts that become deadly. Mm -hmm. Now, the young man, Isaiah, that uh, helped draft the law, he said one of the reasons that he was uh, motivated to get involved 
because he had so many negative interactions yes. with the police and he wanted this um his experiences to resonate throughout Philadelphia how how just a one traffic stop can cause a deadly interaction do you think what uh Isaiah did Mr Isaiah Tom Thomas did do you oh, think yes. it is possible um for this to you know go throughout the United States and Chicago is a place of a lot of high crime areas. Uh, St. Louis is a place of high crime areas. What are your thoughts about this, a ripple effect from this law? Um, I really hope so. I uh, And I think that they are thinking so too. And I thank you for your correction because I said Isaiah Washington. And of course it is <laughs> Isaiah Thomas. Because when I heard him speak, I'm like, wait, the basketball player. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, I think that uh, I think that that's what they hope. I think that they hope that um, other jurisdictions catch on and follow this example. Because, as I said, you know, there's actual, uh, actually reports um, that have been, um, you know, researched and um, vetted that prove that you have these negative outcomes more frequently when you have this quote unquote over policing. Yeah, and I think that this will go uh this type of law will take place throughout other urban corridors where the communities are over police and you had used a, a terminology previously you said community policing where there is a lack of community policing because right. community policing in my opinion is something that we need right in over police areas and high crime areas right. i think that when you have community policing in those types of areas that the, the uh, residents in those areas feel better about seeing the police and they mm -hmm. develop relationships with right. the police. I would love to see a law like this uh, in St. Louis because St. Louis ha you know, has become very uh, violent, but it's getting better. better. I think uh, mayor, our new, we have a new mayor, Mayor Tashara Jones. I think she's doing a great job. However, the crime rate, in this area is it's pretty bad as it is in Chicago, LA, yes. Hamden, New Jersey, you know, Miami, Florida, all of these corridors uh, they have this section that it may be a really great city, a really great place to visit, but it's this section exactly that's very, very, very crime ridden. And I go again with that word, very, very crime ridden. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have to start putting laws in place and policies in place to make, you know, things safer for individuals. Right. What are your thoughts about, you know, I hear people use the term criminalization of, of, of black skin. Do you think black skin has been criminalized and in, in these urban corridors? Well, um, I don't know. That's kind of a, kind of a loaded term as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I will say, uh, I, I want to piggyback on something you said earlier about when um, police officers encounter persons of color. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I forget what you said, how you termed it. I think you said, um, I don't know, but you said that they go straight to, you know, like shoot to kill mode. Yes, if they encounter, if there's a uh, an incident with a person of color, it you know. Oh, you no, said the benefit of the doubt. That's what you said. You no, said that they yeah. don't give the benefit of the doubt, right? And so I guess um, similar to that, my thought is, um, it's like they not only do they not give um, the person of color the benefit of the doubt, but um, it's almost like they hit the panic button. You know what I mean? It's like a black person and it's like they just, they're automatic, their go-to when they encounter a person of color is to shoot to kill. I mean, it's, it, it happens so frequently that, I mean, it's really inexplicable because they report on it. Everybody talks about how it's a shame. Uh, like the um, person uh, that the police saw a person, somebody called uh, the police about this gentleman who was at someone's house and the guy had permission to be there. He was doing something with his car and the police showed up and he ended up dead. And it's like, you know, there's no, 
like you said, no benefit of, of the doubt. No, like, well, maybe, you know, I got misinformation. Maybe this wasn't, you know, really um, clear. Maybe I need to go up. And I just don't think they approach majority persons like that for the most part. I and think if... I think if I think in the same scenario, if they were to approach a person um, of the majority, I think that they would, you know, say, well, let me, you know, ask a few questions. Let me make some inquiries. Let me not just go up. Oh, there he is. Let me pull my gun. So, um, you know, I don't know how you want to interpret that answer. I, I don't want to say yes to, you know, having black skin being criminal, a criminal offense. But I do appreciate that, you know, there's something to, you know, driving while black, walking while black, shopping while black. I mean, there's, there's something to that because it's happened too many times that people have had really negative results, which were unwarranted, unjustified. Um, and the only variable there is color. Well, I think bias, uh, and, and this may just be like a Band-Aid approach, but training I think these neighborhoods and these areas are painted as being so dangerous and violent. Yeah. And when individuals take the job to police these areas, I think there has you, you have to bring it down so that you will recognize the individuals that you will have interaction with. All of these individuals are not in the process of committing a crime. Right. Or or are they reaching for a gun? Exactly. They're, you know, they're reaching for registration. They're reaching for proof. And right, this right. is not an opportunity to shoot. Uh, right. You want to go home at night. And, you know, those types of reactions to individuals. If you're going to police in a particular neighborhood and you know that it has a high crime rate, or I think there needs to be some deterrent teaching on using your weapon uh, if there's any type of altercation. I'm not saying you you run it, you drive into the middle of a gun battle and you right. ask some questions, right. but if you're just approaching a car and you're right. the individual exactly. is just sitting there talking to you, right. it should not escalate to that individual, you know, leaving in a body bag. Exactly. I totally agree. Um, you know, I have participated in so many um, implicit bias uh, sessions, training sessions, and it's really odd because um through these sessions is demonstrated that when you see when um, a majority person and to some extent a minority person sees a person of color, especially a man of color. So what, let me go back. So what these, some, most of these training sessions have a visual component. So what they do is they give the participants clickers to respond to and they show an image. So the image might be of a white person or it might be of a black person and the person might have a, a phone in their hand or they might have a gun in their hand. So the, the way that they are like testing your implicit bias is to see how you to respond, how you respond to those. So what they found is that a black man with a phone in his hand had a harsher response than a white man with a gun. Now that's pretty powerful. <laughs> Can you that's say that again, powerful. please? Yes, ma'am. So this is what they do. So they give you the clicker and you're supposed to click as soon as you have your reaction, right? So the sooner you click, the more, um, how can I say, the inference is that you had a negative reaction to this. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is when they show the image of the black man with a phone in his hand, that got a more violent reaction than a white man with a gun in his hand. That is amazing. It is crazy. It's mind blowing. It is mind blowing. And what's really mind blowing is that it's not just the majority. It's the minority too, maybe not to the same extent, but still because we've been, this is how we have been conditioned and it is implicit. So if we sit and have a conversation and we articulate it, uh, it, it won't come out. But through this, I mean, you can't fake it because you're clicking, you know, right? As soon as you see this stimulus.
stimuli and then you're supposed to respond. And it, it's really difficult. The one saving grace was that um, they say that, that you can be reconditioned. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's what we're left with. But when you see that, you know, a black man with a cell phone is perceived as more dangerous <laughs> than a white man with a gun, I don't know. I, I think that is clearly indicative of a problem. And it, it, yes, and that is why those types of laws not to stop individuals that have, yes. you know, expired tags and those types of minor issues mm -hmm. that will help save many lives in black and brown communities because that implicit bias is there and that reaction is there as well. Right. And when cities recognize that, when all of the uh, different cities recognize that throughout the U.S., we can do something to uh, come to the table and try to resolve some of these issues because there are too many of these incidents. Every year it happens. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Lewis. You're doing an outstanding job. You're listening to Legal Views with Attorney Sheila R. Stewart here live on See Joy Network and on Live 365. We are here this evening discussing many interesting topics as it relates to the recent laws that have been uh, that have been passed in the city of Philadelphia regarding driving equality. Now, since we're on the issue of equality, what are your thoughts about this uh, voter registration and all of this? these efforts that's taken uh, place, a wave of efforts across the United States uh, with voter registration and working against some of the new laws that have been passed that we perceive as voter suppression. Um, so I, if I understood the question, I think what you're asking me is what I think of laws that are being, um, that, are, that they are attempting to pass now that would rectify the voter um, suppression uh yes proceeding. well i mean I, I support them and i i think that um i think that's the cornerstone of this country democracy and i think that you know true democracy is uh inclusion and so i don't understand that the thought process but but behind you know trying to make uh going to the ballot box more difficult trying to have uh the citizens voice be heard more challenging i i don't understand that motivation from a uh, democratic perspective. And I don't mean Democrat versus Republican. I mean, you know, the concept of democracy. Well, that has always been uh, an issue uh, in the United States stemming from, you know, like you stated earlier, not in this context, but using the term the Jim Crow era when uh, many people of color, they could not vote and it was so difficult for them to vote once voting once the law, the voter rights law were passed, it still became a difficult um, task for many individuals to get their votes cast, especially in the South. And there were so many tests and so many obstacles that precluded those individuals from voting. Now we are seeing a resurgence of that in the U.S. where yes. many states have created laws that have made it difficult for those individuals to vote. And do you think mail-in ballots is problematic? Do you think absolutely I not? And I, in fact, I think that mail-in in ballots are important, necessary. And I mean, they've been, um, you know, that's been part of our system for a long time. People in the military, people who are living outside the country for whatever reason, if for diplomatic purposes or whatever, um, I, I don't see that as problematic at all. Absolutely not. I think uh, mail-in ballots, absentee ballots are are needed for democracy and i think when those uh types of um, um uh, voting opportunities are suppressed or made difficult for individuals i think it's going to erode a lot of rights in the in the united states not just the rights of individuals that are black or brown or or poor lower economic status but it's going to hurt the rights of many issues 
many things that are important, such as mm -hmm. schooling and, and uh, redistricting for different school communities and so forth. And I don't think people look at the bigger picture. They just look at a, may look at a particular candidate, but they're not looking at the bigger picture of how voter vote, voting oppression hurts the, the country exactly. and hurts exactly. the community as a whole. So exactly. what do you think, how, do, how can individuals get involved in your opinion? What can individuals do to make this issue uh, heard and how can they get involved? You mean just the um, average citizen? Is that what you mean? Yes, um, in terms of, uh, if, you, if you have an opinion on it, in, in terms of promoting uh, voter rights. I think that, you know, everyone has to, everyone who believes in this expression of democracy has to participate in the process at whatever level they can be most effective. So if it's um, not supporting people who are proponents of uh, suppression through your votes, through your donations, that's one thing. If, uh, you know, certain people who may be so inclined are willing to get out and pound the pavement and share the news, and let everyone know, you know, that these um, these laws are in place and that we need to do something to um, eradicate them. Um, then, you know, I think that's great. And then, of course, you can always run for office yourself. So, I mean, you know, there's the whole political spectrum dealing with and, and as it relates to involvement. So I think at the very least, though, you should be informed you should um, vote and you should be vocal about what you see that's happening that you think is, um, you know, not fair. Judge Lewis, you have done a phenomenal job as usual. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on the show. And before I let you go, I just want to take a moment to talk about Colin, uh, the Honorable Colin Powell, yes. who recently passed. Um, yes. And he was just a trailblazer in everything that he touched, from the yes. military to politics to business. He was just a phenomenal individual, class A individual. What are your thoughts about uh, the passing of uh, Colin Powell? Well, I'm very, very saddened by it. Um, I admired him greatly. I consider him a giant. I consider him a statesman, um, a, a military man, a, um, a man of courage, a man of conviction. I really admire him. And, and although he identified Republican for the most part, um, and I did not, um, I still respected him. And I felt that he was a person of honor and a person of integrity. Um, similar to um, Senator McCain, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think that we can completely run our lives based on political affiliation. I think there's some issues that transcend politics. Absolutely. And, uh, and I just, uh, I think that he was a giant of a man. I mean, he was the first, uh, I remember when he became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, I was so excited. <laughs> Um, and then he became uh, a national security advisor, and then he became a secretary of state. I just, I just admired him so much. And then I thought it was so powerful when um, this person who had been a Republican for his entire career came out and endorsed Barack Obama. And I, I appreciated that because... Um, I felt it was the honorable thing to do. I think he really saw, and I don't think it was about race. I think it was about um, something bigger. I think he saw that there was a historical moment coming, and I think he wanted to be on the right side of history, and I think that's what he did. And I, again, I don't know why I keep referencing um, Senator McCain, but like when Senator McCain was running against him, and uh, people were saying that he was a Muslim, and uh, Senator, Senator McCain said, no, he's not. He's a Christian and he's a good man. I mean, that's powerful to me. Mm -hmm. that, that is, so I'm still talking about him because if he had become president but hadn't been a person of that high integrity, I don't know that we will be even talking about him. But people who can really stand up for what they believe is right and want to, want to be counted as someone who stands for what is right, I admire them. I, I 
hope to live up to that beautiful, beautiful example. And uh, again, I think that the man and his legacy um, are, are, are all inspiring and I've just, you know, pray for his family and his uh, loved ones as they go through this um, very difficult um, time of bereavement. Thank you. I think someone like um, the late Colin Powell, secretary of state, the, the era that he came through to achieve all of those high accomplishments. Yes. There was, I mean, he, uh, he reached so high. And he accomplished everything he set out to do. And he did it with a spirit of excellence. Yes. Everything he did is with a spirit of excellence. Mm -hmm. And his integrity level, as you spoke to, it was just admirable. The way yes. that he approached issues. He was, he was a humanitarian. You know, he yes. was all of that. And I think, you know, what party he was in, I, I, it's, not, it's not even relevant to me. It's who he was as a person, mm -hmm. his achievements. And it appears that he was always true to himself. The yes. fact that he was in a particular party did not change the fiber of his character, yes. the fiber of his integrity, and yes. his, his uh, ability to speak on issues to bring up the lifestyles of all people. Yes. So we salute Colin Powell, Absolutely. his legacy. We salute him for the work that he's done. He was a, he was a general of generals. Yes. And he was, you know, the man of the hour. And we appreciate his service to the U.S. Now, before we, we sign off and turn the mic back over to Daryl, we'll let <laughs> we allow you to have the last few comments. Is there anything you words of wisdom that you would like to uh, leave us with? You are a highly uh, accomplished person yourself. You know, is there any information that you would like to share that, you know, how you achieved all of the things that you have achieved at such a young age? Well, thank you for saying at such a young age. Um, all I would, I guess, uh, first of all, thank you for those wonderful, kind words. But um, I would say that I just reiterate what I said earlier about it being important for you to participate. I don't mm -hmm. think that we live in a day and age where you can sit on the sidelines. I don't think that running for office is for everyone. I don't think that um, running political campaigns or movements is for everyone. But I do think that there is a role for everyone to play to help make our society better. Because mm -hmm. guess what? If our society goes to heck in a handbasket, as uh, the phrase goes, um, <laughs> you're in that handbasket. <laughs> so um, this is your thing. You know, it's like if your car is on fire and you're sitting in the car, uh, that's not a good thing. So I think that everyone should see where they can make a difference, where they can participate, what role they can play to make it better. Um, you know, the old saying is, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Right. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. What about your educational pursuits and being a judge and an effective attorney? I mean, how did you, what, what drove you to do all of these things with also with the spirit of excellence? Um, well, I, uh, when I was in college, I was exposed to some uh, courses that had to do with, well, I guess I should say, um, I always aspired to go to college. For me, it was never something that I was going to think about. Uh, my parents always encouraged me to go, but I, I guess, you know, um, the things that they, the, my upbringing um, gave me that inclination to, that I always wanted to go to college. But I had no I, intention of going beyond a bachelor's degree. I was happy with a bachelor's degree. But um, while I was in college, I was, uh, I did take a class in um, debate. And so I found that interesting. And I know a lot of the people in that class were interested in becoming becoming lawyers. And I wasn't really, but it did, I guess, probably that planted the seed yes, for the first time. Um, then um, later, I just actually felt um, compelled to pursue a career in law. So I went to law school. I became a, a lawyer. I was a prosecutor for a while. Um, then I went into private practice. And then later... Um, I was blessed to be elected to serve on the circuit court of Cook County. 
Well, you've done a great job and we salute you and all that you have done. You've been listening to Legal Views with attorney Sheila R. Stewart. Our guest today has been Judge Cassandra Lewis from Chicago, Illinois. Please tune in with us on next week and we'll have another great guest. Thank you for your time and we will see you on next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.